<laughs> and welcome to this webinar on strategies for creating LGBTQ inclusive anti-bullying policies at the state level. Uh, just for reference, LGBTQ stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Questioning Youth. My name is Kyle Lafferty, and I'm the Project Director for HIV Education uh, with the Society of State Leaders of Health and Physical Education, also known as the Society. I represent one of four national organizations hosting this webinar today. Go ahead and advance. So a little bit about uh, your host. This webinar was actually put together by the National Stakeholders Collaborative, which is a partnership of four national membership organizations. We're focused on improving sexual health outcomes for youth. The NSC has been around since 2003. And in that time, we've convened state health departments and education agencies in 33 states to improve HIV, STD, and teen pregnancy prevention efforts for school age youth. The NSC is funded through a cooperative agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Division of Adolescent School Health. Having said that, our disclaimer, we couldn't have produced this webinar without support from CDC DASH. However, all of the content is solely the responsibility of the NSC and does not necessarily represent the official views of the CDC. Okay. <clears throat> the mission of the National Stakeholders Collaborative is to develop state-level interagency partnerships to improve adolescent reproductive and sexual health programs through shared vision and joint strategies. And the four organizations that make up the NSC include the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, known as AMCHIP, the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors, or NASDAD, the National Coalition of STD Directors, NCSD, and the Society of State Leaders of Health and Physical Education, known as the Society. So before we get started, just a couple uh, housekeeping notes. Phone lines are muted, as I mentioned, um, and they will continue to be muted until the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. If you do have a question throughout the presentation, you can type it into the chat box, which is located on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Um, as a note, the question that you type will only be seen by presenters and not the general audience. This webinar will be recorded, <coughs> and a link to the webinar will be posted on all of the partners' websites in the next day or so. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce you to our presenters. Today we're going to hear from Jeff Soder uh, with the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction in Washington State. We'll also hear from Shannon Sullivan, Executive Director of Illinois Safe Schools Alliance, Allison Gill. Public Policy Associate with the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, also known as GLSEN, and Ryan Schwartz with the National Safe Schools Rapid Response Network. And thanks to our wonderful speakers, we are hoping that by the end of this webinar, our participants will be able to present a rationale for addressing bullying at the state level, access online resources regarding model policy language, and identify strategies for creating and advocating for inclusive anti-bullying policies. So without further ado, I'll hand things off to our first speaker, Jeff Soder with the Department of Education in Washington State, who's going to provide us with an overview of Washington's new anti-bullying legislation. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Jeff Soder again with Washington State's Department of Education. I'm on this call because I was the, uh, the lead for OSPI on developing model policy and procedure this, uh, this past summer and fall uh, to prevent bullying in school based on, and, and it includes a provision around sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. We'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about that in some depth. To, um, um, all, of, all of us have different doorways through which we can promote health, and I wanted you to have a look at my world, um, since ma many of you may not come from, from education departments. 
In Washington State, we have 295 school districts. Many are rural and isolated and small. Um, if you haven't been to Washington State, you may not know that we are a state that's divided by the Cascade Range. Um, and we have a, a western part of the state and an eastern part of the state which are very different culturally. And in fact, you could say the, the west part of our state is blue and the east part of our state is red. And as I approach this task of developing policy and procedure for school districts that are so diverse, um, of course, we don't want to write policy that, that is completely out of step with local culture on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's essential that all kids are safe in school. So that's kind of the tension that we were asked to deal with. Um, I also wanted you to take a look at um, sort of our, our, the status of our students here. And as you can see, almost half our students are income disadvantaged. And what that means to us that is that virtually half our families are income disadvantaged. And yet in our state, parents are required to do much of the work around addressing or, or around following up with districts when bullying isn't being addressed. So, so many students come from disadvantaged families. We also have some of the strongest local control laws in the nation. Parents' recourse when bullying isn't being addressed, can, parents can appeal to principals. If, if they don't get redress there, they can appeal to superintendents, and ultimately they can appeal to school boards. But parents, again, have to do all the work. And as yet, OSPI, where I work, has no authority nor resources to intervene when parents are aggrieved by bullying. So it's a huge challenge for us. And our partners play an essential role in, um, in helping us to address bullying in specific cases. Let's go to the next slide here. Uh, just a quick look at how diverse, this may be a little bit hard to read, but how diverse our schools look. Um, we have primary schools, elementary, middle, secondary, high, comprehensive, all with different configurations. Again, really diverse audience out there that we're writing policy and procedure for. In, in 2010, we were handed a new law that said OSPI would do the following. We would develop state model policy. We would develop state model procedure and in the past, in we've had an anti-bullying law in Washington State since 2002, but in the past, the law simply said that every district had to have an anti-bullying policy. The idea that we would develop state model policy that all districts have to adopt was very new for us and put us in a real leadership role around developing policy and procedure. And the idea that OSPI would actually develop procedure, which was typically under the typically what school district superintendents do, was also new for us. I don't think there's any other case except maybe truancy where OSPI tells districts what their procedure has to be. So very unique and a real opportunity. We also um, in our in our uh, policy and procedure there had to be a primary contact for complaints around harassment, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. We also had to write rules or laws regarding communicati communicating the policy and the procedure to families. Um, harassment, intimidation, and bullying policies, policies and procedures had to be posted on OSPI's website so everybody had access to them. And then um, another organization, the Education Ombudsman's Office, had to provide resources to families. Um, we pulled together a large group of stakeholders initially, and we, then we formed a very small writing work group. Stakeholders were given opportunities to comment on drafts, and I had some thoughts about how to make that process more efficient because we had a lot of drafts floating around for a while um, that were difficult to track. 
and OSPI was responsible for the final documents that were delivered to the education committees of our legislature. So that's generally how the process worked. For today, I thought you might be interested in seeing maybe what's, what's uh, probably unique to Washington State in this process, but maybe there are opportunities in other states to, um, t to do similar work. And I'm calling this unveiling LGBT protection that existed in the law but wasn't very plain for us to see. Um, and it allowed us to bring the protection of gender, gender identity and expression into our new policies and procedures. What I'm showing in this slide is, um, this is directly from statute, from the law, and this is our definition, our state definition of harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Um, it talks about any intentional electronic, verbal, physical act, including but not limited to one shown to be motivated by any characteristic in RCW 9A36080. And then the fuller definition there, physically harms a student or damages the student's property, has the effect of substantially interfering with education, se severe, persistent, or pervasive, has the effect of substantially disrupting the orderly operation of the school. But the important piece is the RCW 9A36080, which, which is actually part of our criminal code. And our state was timid about, action, about defining what those characteristics were, so they, they put the RCW there rather than what the RCW says. They didn't want to have to say sexual orientation, which is one of the characteristics that are protected in our um, in our uh, malicious harassment criminal code, but we'll go there here in a second and you can see. So we're looking for... So there's Washington, there's our criminal code around malicious harassment, 9A36080. Number one is our, our definition of malicious harassment. And earlier it referred to 3A. It is not a defense that the accused was mistaken that the victim was a member of a certain race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, gender, or sexual orientation, or had a mental, physical, or sensory handicap. So that names our protected classes. Um, and that's what we can refer to when we're talking about the protected classes that are included in that anti-harassment, intimidation, and bullying law. It goes on in the Washington Criminal Code to say in number six that per, for the purposes of this section, sexual orientation has the same meaning as RCW 4906040. I hope you're, I hope you're following me as I describe this trail through our statutory codes that eventually leads us to the protection of gender identity and expression. So we get to 4960040, and it's really the laws that govern our Washington Human Rights Commission. And there we have the definition of sexual orientation, which means heterosexuality, um, homosexuality, bisexuality, and gender expression or identity. And then we have a de definition of gender expression or identity. So we finally get to sort of a resolution that wasn't named initially in the, in the harassment, intimidation, and bullying law. Now, OSPI, where I work, was firm that we should bring this protection to light, that it shouldn't be hidden in, stat in statute. And we did get pushback from some of our key members that felt we were sort of overstepping our, bound, our, our boundaries and um, and maybe would and maybe could would cause some consternation among districts that weren't quite ready to go this far. Um, but we felt like it was the law, and therefore we had to to adopt this language and let it see the light of day. So we did that, and we did that in both policy and um, and procedure. 
So our model policy, and I've, I've given you a link to it. You, will, you can go pull it up and take a look at it. We're, we're, we feel good about it. It's imperfect, but it, um, but it has a lot of important pieces to it. It begins with a definition. It um, requires training on the part of districts. It has a prevention component. Um, it, ha it requires districts to intervene to remediate impact on the targeted student, which is often forgotten, and to change the behavior of the perpetrator. It has a piece about retaliation and false allegations, and it asks for uh, compliance officers. So we have a point of contact around bullying, and so there can be some bullying expertise in the district. Parents have a person who they can they can go to, to uh, with their concerns. Model procedure. Um, one, what, you know, we we spent the most time, I think, uh, figuring out model procedure, partly because it's so specific. It's talking about really what's going to happen in the interchange between a principal or an assistant principal and a student, and that's challenging to do from the states from a state perspective when you have so many diverse. Um, audience members. And we certainly checked in with uh, assistant principals. We asked them to, to review the procedure. Would it work for their district? Because we didn't want to have something that was not smart, and wasn't a useful tool. Um, we didn't accept all their, their critiques. Um, you know, sometimes I, I don't think any district out there wants to see bullying happen, but it can be hugely challenging to, to address the problem. One of the things we did very clearly was we held all staff in the school responsible for addressing bullying. So nobody can do nothing. And the procedure even says that, um, that staff can be reprimanded for not addressing bullying to the point of losing their job. So everybody's responsibility is to address it. Uh, definition remains the same, although we, of course, let the, the sexual orientation and gender expression and identity see the light of day. There's a prevention piece, again, a compliance officer. A really criti critical component is an incident reporting form. We've developed a sample form for, and we will continue to develop a, um, additional choices to use, but um, we wanted to be sure that um, families that were not necessarily excellent writers or didn't have the resources to do a lot of um, to do a lot of work around this had a readily avo available form that they could use to begin an investigation of bullying so that's what an incident reporting form is it also is for, uh, for any student to use and reports can come in as anonymous or as um, um, or they can elect to be identified um, there's a lot of different ways in which they can resolve a bullying incident. Reports can also be confidential. Uh, it talks about investigations and gives very strict timelines around how quickly investigations have to happen, realizing that the targeted student is is vulnerable as long as as long as the investigation is going on. And then it has a new right of appeal that is specific to targeted students if they feel like they're they're, they haven't been heard by an assistant principal, then they can go to the superintendent or they can go to the school board if necessary. Um, we also, as I said, were responsible for writing rules around the distribution of um, the policy and procedure, and, the, and we share here, districts are required to share with their families incident reporting forms there's a lot of text on that page, but it basically is what our new rule is around distribution of policy and procedure to families. Um, so districts will publish at a minimum policy and procedure, incident reporting form, and current contact information for the district's harassment, intimidation, and bullying compliance officer. Uh, we don't tell them exactly how they have to publish it because we assume districts are, are expert at publishing 
materials for families, but everybody's required to, to make it uh, readily available to their families. And then I've given you some addresses if you want electronic copies of any of this material, um, model policy, model procedure. Um, the frequently asked questions document is particularly helpful because it gives you the reasons why we made the choices we made as we developed policy and procedure. And then, like I said, a uh, sample harassment, intimidation, and bullying incident reporting form. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. That was wonderful. And just so everyone knows, we will be sending out um, links to all the resources that Jeff discussed following the webinar. Um, and if folks have questions for presenters, feel free to type them into the chat box as we move through the webinar, and we'll uh, have a chance to address all of them at the end. So thank you so much, Jeff. Now um, I'd like to introduce Shannon Sullivan with the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance, who is going to discuss the drafting, lobbying, and passage of Illinois Safe Schools Law in 2010. Thanks. Hi, everybody. This is Shannon from Illinois, um, and I hope that I'm speaking loud enough. But if I'm not, just I, I am able to watch the chat box um, as it goes. So if I'm not, just let me know. Um, here in Illinois, we are pleased to say that, oh wait, here's my um, email address and phone number, um, just so that you have it in case anybody would like it afterwards. Um, we're excited to say that nothing perfect, but we did draft and pass um, a Safe Schools Act. Our governor actually signed it on Pride Sunday, June 27, 2010, here in Illinois. Um, and uh, we started this work tar in a targeted way, though, I should say, in 2006. Um, and the, the first way that we did that was really trying to learn from what other states had done. So on this slide, this is not a full picture of some of the folks we talked to and worked with, but really primarily those first two bullet points, what happened in Massachusetts really in the mid-90s, and then what had happened in Iowa, uh, because they're our next door neighbor, was very important for us. Um, and Iowa had been much more recent. Um, uh, in terms of the work that, that statewide organizations had done. In Massachusetts, it actually led to the creation of a safe schools program within their Department of Education focusing on LGBT students. In Iowa, the work that was done there did lead to the passage of a safe schools law and then actually very quickly to a marriage equality law in Illinois as well. Um, and both Massachusetts and Iowa had done, um, in their own way, a whole series of town hall meetings across their states. Um, that were supported by organizing really broad-based local coalitions um, and then really putting the youth at the forefront of giving testimony as to why schools needed to address sexual orientation and gender identity issues. Um, so here in Illinois, what we did based on those learnings, particularly from Massachusetts and Iowa, and I'll get back to North Carolina later because we learned a lot from them as well, um, we launched here at the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance the Town Hall Project. That's what it was called then. Um, we had a partnership with the ACLU of Illinois, which was really tremendous to have um, in terms of their own staff time and support. And our goal was to organize youth adult partnerships throughout Illinois in support of doing locally based LGBTQ safe schools work. And what that means for us is young people creating gay straight alliances, schools being willing to conduct professional development specifically on sexual orientation and gender identity issues, and working for local policy change, right? So making sure sexual orientation and gender identity start to get into all types of local policies at schools. And then this idea of all these people doing local work would eventually create a statewide network in support of a statewide safe schools bill. And we made sure to do all of these outside of Chicago. Um, uh, you know, Washington State, which I know well, is tremendously divided. Illinois uh, is the same way, except that it tends to be Chicago and then everything else. Um, and everything else is a lot of state for us. Um, and, and we really wanted to avoid any notion that this eventual statewide bill be seen as a Chicago-only bill. Um, and it would alienate tons of state representatives and senators whose support we would need. So we established the town hall project in, uh, eventually in five areas of Illinois outside of Chicago, but ranging widely from north to south, since we are a long, thin state. Um, and those are actually still operational. The, the youth adult partnerships still exist. They still are responsible for overseeing the LGBTQ safe schools work locally that they're interested um, in conducting and are now uh, helping us 
uh, with the bill implementation, which I will also come back to because that's a very important part of uh, the work. I do also want to say that um, we had a lot of support from the State Equality Fund um, in doing the, the work that we did to both draft and pass the bill. The State Equality Fund is a partnership of the Gill Foundation, um, the Haas Jr. Foundation out of California, an anonymous donor that accepts proposals uh, for organizations that are engaged. It has to be state level policy change around safe schools um, and other areas, marriage equality, that kind of stuff. Um, but without their support, it would have been, I, I'm guessing, almost impossible to do the work that we did. Um, they did make a commitment to us initially for two years um, and then made um, a third year commit commitment to us um, when it became clear that we actually had a shot at passing the bill. Um, I'll leave it at that. So just so that folks know that the State Equality Fund exists. Um, and if there is statewide work ongoing, it's definitely a resource to check out. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to be sure to mention, and Jeff actually spoke a lot about including gender identity and expression, um, when we were able in Illinois to pass our Human Rights Act amendment uh, to include sexual orientation and gender identity, which happened for us in 2006, a lot of the, the hoo-ha that was created over it was about including gender identity as a protected category. As a result, it actually, very similar to the language Jeff showed us from Washington, gender identity got included as part of the definition of sexual orientation. Um, I, you know, and it's a political compromise, and it worked here in Illinois in the Human Rights Act, but we are very conscious at the Alliance that sexual orientation and gender identity are not the same thing. Um, and we actually wanted to get language into our bill, that's not a law, um, that had gender identity and expression listed separately as its own protected category in the anti-bullying law. So what we did while we were organizing statewide these youth adult partnerships was also worked very closely with the Illinois State Board of Education and the Chicago Public Schools and did eventually get them both to add gender identity slash expression as a protected category in their policies and regulations. And the goal in doing that was so that legislators, when looking at the bill, were going to balk at gender identity expression being there, and then we would then refer them back and say, well, it's already in the State Board of Education regulations and the Chicago Public Schools non-discrimination policy, so it needs to be in this bill, or law now, um, in order to reflect what the policies already are at the two major educational institutions in the state of Illinois. Um, it also benefited us to work closely with the State Board of Education in that process because during that relationship building that we did, we also got them to um, give their partnership as we were drafting the language for the bill. Um, and having them involved in that process actually led to them helping us work the bill in Springfield, which is our capital, when we began working the bill. And that gave us a lot of legitimacy as a nonprofit organization um, to have the State Board of Education with their staff working the bill as well. Um, and I didn't put a slide in about this, but I should say that um, we've, had, we've had various versions of draft language of this bill for years in Illinois. Um, and what we proposed was not what was passed at all. But what we proposed was really informed by working with a lot of national organizations like GLSEN, like the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, the Family Equality Council, who really helped us look at safe schools laws and bills across the country and pick out language that was promising um, so that we could have a really good sense of what was cutting edge language to propose here in Illinois based on what was working and not working in other states. Uh, so that's definitely another um, uh, avenue of resources that we went to. The national organizations tend to have a good sense of what's happening in states across the country that we may not have the sense of that. Um, so going back to what we learned from North Carolina, which was on one of the first slides, North Carolina, I think it took them about three tries to pass their safe schools uh, bill into law. And during that time, they organized the Prevent School Violence North Carolina Coalition. So we just stole their name and called ours Prevent School Violence Illinois. Um, but what they shared with me in terms of their lessons learned was that having the broad-based coalition of support statewide is so critical um, to convincing you know, legislators and constituents of legislators, really, to vote in favor of a bill like this. So in organizing Prevent School Violence Illinois, 
um, we really tried to think very broadly about the usual and unusual suspects um, in terms of who would support an anti-bullying bill here in Illinois. I mean, some of the obvious, you know, work with mental health folks, public health folks, racial justice, disability rights. Um, this law is going to impact all of their work, um, but also really trying to reach out to um, religious organizations and constituencies um, and trying to think very broadly about who would be in support of this bill. Uh, right now, the Prevent School Violence Illinois Coalition has over 70 organizational members and is still very active after passing the bill in supporting the implementation of the law. And then here's the famous slide on compromise, right? So the, the bill that we introduced, um, actually we started in the Illinois State Senate, uh, did mandate both professional development and data collection that would be reported to the State Board of Education um, as part of the bill. Um, that was almost immediately stripped out because anything that had a, a star on it that had a fiscal mandate, was, they were actually sending to this fiscal mandate committee, which was really like death of the bill committee. You would never see it again. Um, and so very quickly, um, we did take those two things out of the bill, um, which now we're charged with working to get them back in into um, further amendments. Um, so definitely, like I said before, what we passed is not anywhere near ideal. And I should have put in the language um, in a slide, which I didn't. I can send out a link to the actual law. But uh, we love, so far, the language about the protected categories. So our law here in Illinois says, bullying on the basis of actual or perceived race, color, religion, sex, national origin, ancestry, age, marital status, physical or mental disability, military status, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, unfavorable discharge from military service, association with a person or group with one or more of the aforementioned actual or perceived characteristics or any other distinguishing characteristic is prohibited in all school districts. Um, and then it goes on to define, you know, what bullying and harassment is and where it's actually prohibited. But one of the things that we didn't get picked on at all was that list, which was a surprise. Um, and I think, again, it is because we had already done the work with the um, state and Chicago educational agencies to make sure, sure that gender identity and expression were there. Um, so the other thing to note um, during our work to actually pass the bill into law is that um, we let the youth do the talking again. Um, so uh, it was only young people who provided testimony in front of legislatures and committees uh, during our work. Uh, to pass the bill, um, and it, it, there were definitely Alliance youth who were out there out front of it talking about sexual orientation and gender identity, but also, um, oh, you want the link to the, the law here? I can do it when I'm done presenting. Um, so someone wanted the link to the actual law, I think. Um, uh, we also worked with the Prevent School Violence Illinois Coalition uh, members so that there were youth who were talking about, you know, being bullied based on uh, perceived or actual disability or skin color or body size, um, which would fall into these other distinguishing characteristics category that we have. Um, and it, I was stunned. It actually passed our house 108 to 0 um, after some really moving testimony from um, one of our young people from Peoria, Illinois, who talked about bullying based on body size and sexual orientation. Uh, and I'm just about to wrap up. Um, the other thing that the law did that we didn't anticipate was, um, and this was suggested during the passing the bill process, was it created the Illinois School Bullying Prevention Task Force, which is an appointed task force under the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, uh, I'm on the task force. Our report is due to the General Assembly March 1st, which you all know is next week. Um, and it gives us an opportunity to recommend further changes to the law, which we're going to go back to that um, ideal language that we had originally introduced. And we may not try to work it this session, given that our um, budget deficit is uh, still second only to California's. We may wait until the future to try to push those changes to the law. But it's also giving us an avenue to recommend um, funding for some pilot projects and other related projects in the state of Illinois uh, to figure out in different contexts, because schools are tremendously contextual and differ widely from one another based on a number of factors, what would work in terms of school bullying prevention. 
um, and is giving us an avenue, actually we'll be recommending the abolishment of punitive school discipline um, because of the racial disparities associated with it, um, and actually recommend that schools cannot do bullying prevention in a vacuum without embarking on a process of school transformation uh, to completely change the culture and climate uh, of schools in Illinois to set students up with the opportunity for academic uh, engagement and achievement. So it should be very interesting when we submit that to the General Assembly on March 1st. Uh, I wasn't crazy about the task force to begin with um, because I'm on a lot of task forces that don't do much, um, but this has been a different experience uh, for us. Um, and we have the Prevent School Violence Illinois Coalition active and supporting the work of the task force since the task force um, is so few people. Um, and, and so the coalition itself then is going to take the report as it gets submitted to the General Assembly and begin again working it across Illinois along with our implementation efforts to implement the law. And just a note, again, a shout out to our young people who are amazing. Um, one of the things that our youth leaders across the state have done um, was draft and produce the Achieving Change Toolkit, um, which is a toolkit for young people to organize um, in their communities to change their school policy to be in line with the new law. Um, and right now, the, the youth leaders are piloting this in three areas of the state. They're going to see the results that they get and then revise and re-release statewide for the 2011-12 school year to do uh, a much larger uh, implementation um, push, youth-led Im implementation push statewide. Um, and, and Gary Jenkins has asked again, is the toolkit accessible online? No, not yet, but it will be. Um, after the pilot process, then it will be completely published online. Um, <laughs> now i got a smiley face. Okay, so I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I'm hopeful there will be questions at the end because um, there was a, you know, a lot, obviously, in the process uh, that I didn't mention that may be interesting to people, but you do also have my contact information as well. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was wonderful. And um, the, the resources that you mentioned um, when you were speaking, if you want to send them out through chat or you can send them to me, um, and I'll be sure to send everyone copies of the resources that were discussed during the webinar. Um, and now we will pass it on to Allison Gill with the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, known as GLSEN, who will provide an overview of GLSEN's work at the state and local level around school bullying policies. Great. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, this is Allison. Let me know, if, please, if you can't hear me or if I'm not speaking loud enough. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, safe schools laws, and GLSEN considers two different types of legislation to really be safe schools laws. Um, that is anti-bullying laws and non-discrimination laws that affect the school environment. Anti-bullying laws um, usually are generally preventative and educational in nature. And they usually require school districts to adopt anti-bullying policies with specific list of requirements. Um, and these requirements can include things like training and professional development for educators and staff. They can include uh, required reporting of bullying incidents and accountability beyond the district level to maybe the uh, Department of Education in the state, uh, as well as anti-bullying programs for students and a number of other components. Things like, uh, it's really pretty adaptable by state. It could be things like anonymous reporting or, or many other components. Um, for example, the Washington, um, uh, that, that Jeff spoke about, the, the Washington law that has a reporting form that makes it easier for um, uh, educators to actually fill out on the form, you know, the incidents that they see. So um, and it's also non-discrimination laws. Uh, so these are not specifically about bullying and harassment, but they can definitely create a claim for discrimination of stu of for schools for failing to prevent bullying based on protected characteristics. Um, they can really cause schools to take bullying and harassment of LGBT students more seriously. So we also work to oppose negative laws um, that might harm or isolate LGBT students. And this can include a huge variety of laws and policies, such as um, policies that prevent access to resources or discussion of, of sexuality, laws that impact supportive student groups, such as gay straight alliances, laws that prevent the collection of data. There's some, state, some states have laws that prevent you uh, from asking on, on tests uh, without parental permission, you know, uh, students' sexual orientation or other things that might make it difficult to gather data about students. 
laws that stigmatize LGBT students, such as no, so-called no promo homo laws. Okay. So one, I'm going to talk, uh, stress one important point that Jeff and uh, Shannon have already talked about, and that's enumeration in anti-bullying laws. I have here an example of enumeration language, which is basically uh, a specification of specific characteristics that, that are frequently the target of bullying and harassment. This language comes from a bill currently being considered in Oklahoma, and I'll just read it. It means any uh, gesture, expression, communication, etc., that is reasonably perceived as being motivated by actual or perceived characteristics such as race, color, religion, national origin, ancestry, ethnicity, sexual orientation, physical, mental, or emotional, or learning disability, gender, gender identity and expression, or other distinguishing personal characteristics of a student, or is based on association with any person um, with any of the characteristics identified above. So there's really three important aspects here. There's the actual or perceived uh, in the beginning, so that the student in question does not actually, you know, does not actually have to be gay or lesbian or, you know, race uh, of a particular race in order to be protected. It's, it, the, these anti-bullying laws are, of course, meant to protect all students. Um, these are just specific characteristics that are frequently targets of bullying and harassment. So the actual and perceived helps make that clear. Then there's the list itself, um, which is perfectly adaptable. It's really adaptable by state. We do recommend that you know people include, um, of course, you know a minimum of, of these categories, and particularly gender identity and sexual orientation. <laughs> Uh, and also based on association, so associational language, which can be really important for students, for example, that come from um, same-sex families or students who are friends with other students who might be bullied and harassed based on one of these characteristics. And that, that will help provide protection to those students as well. Okay. So why is enumeration important? Our uh, Glisson's research has shown that enumeration in anti-bullying laws is critical to ensure that all students are protected from bullying and harassment. Compared to school districts without enumerated policies, students who attend schools with policies that enumerate categories report less bullying and harassment. Students who attend schools with enumerated policies are harassed far less often for, re for an assortment of reasons, including such as their physical appearance, their sexual orientation, and their gender expression. And this research, uh, let me, before I continue, this research comes from uh, two research reports uh, that, GLSEN, that we'll make available after the webinar. Um, GLSEN's 2009 National School Climate Survey, which looks at the experiences of LGBT students across the country in schools uh, with regard to bullying and harassment and a lot of other categories. And also the From Teasing to Torment report, which is from 2005 and looks, is not focused on LGBT students, but looks at all students and bullying and harassment behavior. Um, so where was I? Students who attend schools from enumerated, with enumerated policies are less likely than other students to report a serious pro harassment problem at their school and are 50% more likely to feel very safe at school. LGBT students who attend schools without such an enumerated policy, in, on the other hand, are three times more likely to skip class because they feel uncomfortable or unsafe. In fact, LGBT students without an enumerated policy have the same experience of bullying and, har and harassment as students who live in states without any anti-bullying and harassment laws. So this is really critical for very marginalized students, in particular LGBT students, to order to create real protections uh, that, that apply to LGBT students. Enumeration provides teachers and other educators the tools they need to implement anti-bullying and harassment policies, which makes it easier for them to prevent bullying and, bullying and intervene when, when incidents occur. School staff often fear that they themselves will be targeted for intervening on behalf of LGBT students given the, you know, based on the environment in their schools. And when they can point to language that provides clear protection for LGBT students, they feel more comfortable in enforcing the policy. Enumeration helps edu increase educator awareness uh, that anti-LGBT harassment and discrimination are unacceptable behaviors and warrant intervention. A lot of times, uh, you know, you hear that this sort of behavior against LGBT students is just typical or just students being students or it's just a school environment. And it really makes it clear, enumeration really makes it clear that this sort of behavior is, in fact, bullying and harassment. 
and that both educators and students aware, know that. Students report that teachers were significantly more likely to intervene always or most of the time in states with enumerated policies as compared to states with either non-enumerated policies or no policies at all. So we really do see that it makes a difference on the ground. So um, I guess the next question is, which states have enumerated policies? Here's our map. This is actually available on GLSEN's website, and we'll also a link will be sent around. This is a map of all the states we consider to have enumerated anti-bullying laws, and there are currently 10 uh, marked in blue. Uh, most states have generic anti-bullying laws that do not specifically enumerate categories. Uh, there are about five states without any significant anti-bullying laws at all. So most states fall in the generic, not, not enumerated. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read through the questions here. Okay. I will get to the questions at the end uh, as best I can. So um, let me just tell you about one, some of the work we did last year. In New York, uh, there was an, an, an enumerated anti-bullying bill passed last year. Uh, GLSEN worked with uh, several other statewide organizations, including the uh, New York Civil Liberties Union, the um, Empire State Pride Agenda, which is the state's largest LGBT group, um, the Anti-Defamation League, and other organizations to really support this bill, which was called DASA, the Dignity for All Students Act. And, and like in uh, other states, as Shannon was talking about, there was a coalition of about 200 different organizations that were supporting this measure. Um, DASA has been under consideration and brought up in one way or another for about 10 years in New York. So it was really kind of a, a long-term goal to get it passed, and it passed last year pretty convincingly. There was, there was little opposition last year. So that's just one example of some of the statewide work that, that, that GLSEN has been involved with. I'm also going to talk about some of the local campaigns that we've been involved with. So examples of localities which passed comprehensive enumerated anti-bullying policies in 2010 include Salt Lake City, Utah, Dallas, Texas, Jackson, Mississippi, Cobb County, Georgia, Frederick, Maryland, and Anoka Hennepin, Minnesota. And so GLSEN was involved in, in some ways or another with partner organizations, usually providing resources, talking points, and other, other sorts of technical assistance to uh, local organizations and statewide organizations who are working on to pass these local policies. So uh, Shannon talked a little bit about why it's important to have uh, local policies passed. Uh, you know, local policies can really help to move forward statewide anti-bullying efforts. There are a lot of states where, for a variety of reasons, advocates have not been able to move forward with enumerated anti-bullying laws that are statewide. Um, but policy gains can often still be achieved at the local level. In addition to protecting students in some of the state, uh, state's largest districts, this work can help facilitate statewide advocacy. It can help to uh, bring together the, co the various coalitions to work on the issue. Um, it can, help. it can also create models when these districts pass strong, comprehensive policies that can eventually serve as models for statewide implementation. So, uh, GLSEN works with a number of um, types of organizations in order to support their state and local policy work. Uh, we have about 35 chapters around the country in various different states. We've also worked with groups like Gay Straight Alliances um, in, in schools, especially you know, students. Students can be very, very powerful advocates for, for these sorts of laws and policies at the local level and at the statewide level. I'm sorry, I'm just reading some notes. Uh, we'll, of course, work with parents and educators. Other community groups like PFLAG and um, uh, organizations such as ACLU affiliates, they can be, the ACLU uh, their, and their statewide affiliates can be very, very helpful in moving forward with these sorts of uh, bills in states around the country. Uh, Shannon mentioned how they helpful they were in, in Illinois, and uh, they were also very helpful in New York, 
um, and Mississippi. There was a lot of work done on some great statewide work in, in Mississippi last year. And of course, teachers unions are incredibly important. There's also, uh, Glisten is joined by about 80 other members of the National Safe Schools Partnership to support the federal anti-bullying bill, the Safe Schools Improvement Act. A lot of those um, organizations have state affiliates. And so often we're able to find, uh, to help support statewide work and coalition building, we're able to find state affiliates of the NSSP in order who would like to get involved with the process and link them up with, with advocates we know are working to pass statewide uh, anti-bullying legislation. So the sorts of resources we offer uh, local, both local partners and, and state partners working on these sorts of policies and uh, bills our technical assistance with legislation and strategy, um, you know, um, detailed research on bullying and harassment, which I've spoken a little bit about, but uh, often we're able to provide actual breakout briefs you, ba you based on the information from our national school climate survey on a particular state, which can be very helpful for persuading state legislatures, legislators um, to support bullying and harassment measures. We also have a full assortment of model state um, model policies, including model state legislation, a model district policy, and a model uh, school anti-bullying policy. And those resources will be passed, um, the, the web page of those will be passed around at the end of this call. We also are able to provide talking points on a lot of these issues, both based on um, you know, the importance of enumeration, uh, about fiscal issues when those are raised, uh, you know, Bullying can, of course, cost school districts quite a, quite a bit of money, and, and it's important to keep that in consideration when people talk about the, the ex, you know, if the school, when people start to talk about that a, a school uh, anti-bullying bill is very expensive because it requires training, you really have to consider the other side of that. What, what, sort, of, what sort of absenteeism are we seeing in schools, and uh, are they subject to higher liability because of the bullying harassment that's, being, that's occurring in school? We also provide assistance with coalition building, as I mentioned, through the NSSP. Glisten has a network of chapters and constituents who are often able to reach out to to help support anti-bullying measures. And we travel and provide quite a bit of advocacy training to, to youth uh, who wish to participate in this process. Um, so I just want to mention one other resource that's not from Glisten, but it's very important, and that is the Department of Education, which recently, uh, just a few months ago, put out guidelines and best practices for state anti-bullying laws. And they do include guidelines such as enumeration. It's actual, um, they're quoting actual state uh, laws, pieces of them that have passed uh, with regard to anti-bullying policies around the country for to support the various uh, different sessions. Um, so anti, there's the enumeration section and the reporting section. They'll, they'll quote various laws that they think are, represent strong examples. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll send that to Kyle so she can make that available to you all as well. And that's it. I'd be happy to take questions at the end. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Allison, uh, for sharing those great resources. And like you mentioned, um, I will be sending out links and resources to all participants following the webinar. Um, we have also been recording the questions that you all are typing into the chat box. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we'll have plenty of time to ask those questions of our presenters. So last but not least, we have Ryan Schwartz with the Safe Schools Rapid Response Network, who is going to share some best practices for messaging, framing, and organizing related to anti-bullying advocacy work. Great, thank you. Um, so this uh, presentation is going to focus on um, public opinion and how to talk about um, these, this type of work. But let me, um, let me start off by introducing myself. Uh, I coordinate a, uh, a loose network of organizations called the Safe Schools Rapid Response Network. And what we do is we help local advocates um, defend uh, inclusive anti-bullying laws or inclusive curriculum um, when they come under attack. Um, and oftentimes we work with educators and, and allies in a specific community, um, but we help bring together some of the expertise of um, some folks who have been doing this work for a long time. Um, and the way that I think this kind of interacts with the call today is that we get to um, see firsthand like, 
uh, how people react to the ways that we talk about LGBT inclusive policies with schools. Um, and we figured out a few things over the years about, um, you know, why there might be pushback and how we can talk about these things um, to help people understand the benefits of having inclusive statewide anti-bullying laws. Um, so throughout, um, Throughout the conversation, I'm, gonna, I'm going to reference a few different instances that we've seen over the past year um, and talk about some different polling and focus groups that have been done by researchers around the country um, to talk about these issues um, and see what the best approach is for winning public opinion. So I'd like to start off with, um, you know, why, why do we need statewide policies? And all of the presenters before me have, have talked about it a little bit. Um, but I think one of the, the primary stories comes from um, some focus groups that were done with teachers about bullying. Um, and they, you know, the, the pollsters said, well, well, what exactly is bullying? And, and nobody could provide a clear answer. And they said, well, what about if a student, you know, um, just calls another kid dumb? Well, and they said, well, I don't know, it depends if I call that bullying or not. Well, what about if somebody calls another student fat? Well, it kind of depends on the con context if that's bullying or not. Um, and they said, well, is there anything that you see in the classroom that is definitely bullying? And they said, yes, racial slurs. Um, and the takeaway, I, I think, from this, this, little, uh, this focus group was um, what they said is that um, the reason that they would react to racial slurs, but not homophobic slurs or not slurs about body size, um, is because they know that they would have support from their principal. Um, and from the district, because they've been told um, in repeated trainings that racial slurs are not okay. Um, and their reaction to other types of bullying was that, well, it's not very clear if it's actually bullying or not. It depends on the context. Um, and they said that they would um, hesitate to intervene because they weren't sure if they would have the support of the higher-ups. Um, so that's, you know, I think one really strong reason is that a statewide bullying policy sends a message to teachers about what exactly is bullying um, and when it's appropriate to intervene. Um, and right now, they, they, uh, teachers are saying that they, they don't have a clear idea of what that actually looks like. Um, the second reason I think this, uh, that's important is that um, with model policies like uh, what Jeff showed, um, it, it, it creates something that's easily replicable for districts. Um, it provides contacts at the state level. Sometimes it provides funding, provides models and, pay, and, and forms that, that, that districts can use, um, and it creates everything that's really needed um, to, 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 for districts to start talking about bullying and start focusing on it. Um, and that's kind of a key message as well, is that, it, that statewide policies like that will decrease the burden on, on local districts for having to create um, their own policy from, from scratch. Um, so along with kind of those clear standards, statewide policies often encourage um, more grassroots involvement. So uh, what I really liked about what Shannon was talking about is that now that they've got a policy, their students are getting involved and the youth are getting involved to really look at implementation um, and see how that's playing out. And that's a really great um, effect of statewide policies as well. But also we, we sometimes have reluctant districts who are actually maybe even see that um, or think about bullying as kind of a rite of passage. Um, and this gets them on board as well. So um, I think for those reasons, statewide enumerated policies are are important. Um, and so for the rest of the, um, the talk, I'm going to look at some of the messages and frameworks that come up when talking about statewide anti-bullying policies, um, how people talk about these things, and how we can gain support. Um, so there are six different issues that I'm going to look at, and these, these tend to come up pretty much any time there's talk about um, having curriculum or anti-bullying work done in schools that addresses LGBT issues. So the first one is, is about burdens, um, and especially in today's political world, um, the, a lot of things that we hear when, when states consider anti-bullying legislation is that this is just another bureaucracy, right? That it's another layer of, of work that districts are going to have to deal with or teachers are gonna, gonna have to deal with. Um, and that's something that comes up a lot. And in, in reality, I think the opposite is true, that, that these types of policies will actually decrease the burden. Um, I think you know, when talking about these things, it's important to point out that right now we are confused, right? Teachers are confused. There's no clear standard for what bullying actually is. And so teachers don't have um, any, you know, uh, 
any um, standard for, for when to get involved. And that's what we heard in those focus groups that I talked about earlier. So having a bullying policy will actually provide context and examples and models for how to address bullying, and when to address bullying, what counts as bullying or harassment. Um, and that actually makes it a lot easier in the classroom. Um, and I think that we hear from time time and time again that teachers really uh, want more guidance about when to get involved and they want to know that they've got their support of the higher ups for stepping in in bullying situations. Um, the other important thing to point out when you're talking about uh, anti-bullying policies is that this is not new curriculum. And a lot of times it gets jumbled up and, and you'll hear parents say, well, why are we talking about bullying? Shouldn't we be focused on, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic? Um, and I think that, that when preparing for advocating for statewide bullying policies, it's important, important to build in language about how this is not extracurriculum, right? That this is actually going to make it easier for kids to be learning in classrooms to provide support for teachers and, and school staff across the board. Um, and that no, this isn't taking away classroom time. Um, it, quite the opposite, it's allowing teachers to know how to address situations when they arise so that they can regain control of the classroom um, and make sure that, that learning um, objectives are obtained. So um, it actually makes learning easier. Um, so that's an important one, I think, to, to prepare for when, when talking about these issues. Okay. This is where we get a lot of pushback specifically around the LGBT content, is around the idea of sex and the idea of politics. So unfortunately, any, any mention of LGBT issues conjures up for most people these two things. Um, and um, so there's been focus groups done with parents. Um, and they've asked, well, you know, how would you talk to your kids about gay people? And nobody had an answer. There was lots of ums, lots of nervousness, red faces, like, I don't know how to talk about that. And they said, well, what is that? And they said, well, you, you know, the birds and the bees. Um, and so when it was proposed, well, why can't you tell kids that um, some people have two dads and two moms, and that gets nowhere near a conversation about sex, it was kind of like light bulbs went off. Like, when people hear about LGBT issues, they immediately are sexualized. They immediately think about sex. Um, and so that plays into the way that these conversations happen, because um, when some parents will hear the idea of talking to kids about anti-gay bullying, it's hard for them to understand talking about these things without talking about sex. And we've got to understand that to successfully reach those people and help them understand what we're really talking about. Um, similarly, um, th these issues are very political. So people immediately go to a political mindset when they hear this. Um, and one of my favorite examples was um, in some polling groups, people asked about um, how would you feel if, you're, if the teacher came to school and talked about what their family did this weekend? And said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Like, everybody, everybody does that. And then they said, what happens if your teacher said, me and my husband, and it was, it was a woman, she said, me and my husband um, took our kids to the zoo this weekend. And they said, of course, that, that's definitely fine. And then they said, well, what happens if it was a same-sex couple, and the teacher was male and said, me and my husband took our kids to the zoo this weekend? And they said, oh, no, absolutely not. That's politics. Um, and so, so understanding the way people see these issues as very political, as very uh, much about sex, helps us understand how we can reach them and help them understand what it is about. Um, and so when dealing with this type of framework, I think that it's really helpful um, to let kids do the talking. Because it's really easy to read a political statement or even read like, um, something about sex into something coming from an adult but um, it, it's harder when it's a kid. And Shannon talked a little bit about this, that they really had success when they let kids do the talking. Um, and, and I think that that's equally true here. So um, it's, it's hard to read that this is a political issue or an issue about sex ed when you have a sixth grader talking about bullying. It, it's even harder to read that into it when you've got young kids um, who are now elementary school saying, you know, maybe a kid with same-sex parents saying, I can't talk about my family because people laugh at me, right? Then it's, um, it becomes clearer about what we're talking about and that this isn't really about politics, that this isn't really about sex, but it's a way for people to develop empathy and fully understand what, what, um, what, we, what we're talking about when we talk about the bullying that goes on in schools. Okay. Here's another big framework that comes up a lot when we talk about, um, about anti-bullying policies. 
parents' rights. Um, what we know from when talking to parents about these issues um, is that parents feel like they have a loss of control over what their kids are learning. And um, this is something else we've got to keep in mind when kind of meeting them in the middle. Um, they feel that having uh, classrooms address bullying, address racial bullying, address uh, homophobic bullying, uh, somehow is impeding on their ability to raise their kids the way they'd like. And I remember recently in Montana there was um, a very lively debate in Helena about the, a new health policy. And um, I, I remember seeing video from one of the, um, the school board meetings and a woman set up and said, look, if I don't want you teaching my kids about nutrition, if I want to take my kids to McDonald's, it's my right. If my kid wants to bully, it's his right to do that. Um, and so, you know, we've got to understand that, that the way parents come at this issue is very reactionary and it's very much um, from um, kind of a, a, an embedded feeling of, of needing to protect kids. So I think what's important um, to point out in these types of situations is, um, is first of all that, that bullying happens to everyone, right, including your kid, and that bullying affects everybody. So that this isn't just about um, protecting the gay kids or protecting the kids that don't fit in. Um, this, this bullying creates an unsafe climate for everybody um, and help people understand that what they should be concerned about is the loss of control um, of their kids being happy and healthy in a school environment. The other angle on this is that I believe that bullying policies really do help parents get, and adults get back in control of the conversations. I think that um, when people are concerned about, about this kind of parent rights, parental control, um, they feel like they're losing the ability to have these conversations at home. But in reality, what we see is that, that this type of bullying that happens when it's not addressed, um, it allows conversations about these issues to go on behind adults' backs or to happen in ways that are not age appropriate or um, irresponsible. And by, by implementing a bullying policy and giving the teachers the encouragement and the tools to address bullying when they see it, it's a way to bring adults back into the conversation um, and, and so that, that this stuff doesn't happen um, kind of uncontrolled or at the will of, of youth, um, but it's really that teachers have an ability now to, to, to bring it back home and actually to even share that information with parents. Um, and so when, when we're talking about these like parents' rights, um, I would recommend that you frame the bullying legislation as it's a way to um, talk about what's going on in school, what's going on on the playground or behind teachers' backs, and making those conversations visible to parents and adults. So when um, kids are reporting these things, when kids have the tools and, and encouragement to talk about what's going on, it's a way for parents to get back involved. Um, and that's one way to, to deal with this kind of argument. Um, and also help parents see that this isn't taking away their rights, that it really is getting them back involved with what goes on at school. Okay. Um, another way to talk about bullying frameworks, which we see a lot, is um, about, uh, about students feeling safe and comfortable at school. And it's really, again, important to point out that this isn't just about gay kids. And I think that with the, with the rash of suicides that we saw um, a few months ago, um, there was a renewed charge to address bullying, but a lot of the conversations were, well, we've got to help these kids. We've got to help the gay kids feel accepted. Um, and, you know, there, there's definitely um, that, that argument pulls weight, especially with the suicides, but it's really hard to win over a lot of public opinion um, with that argument alone. So, again, it's really important that um, we bring up that this isn't just about students who identify as gay or even students who are targeted as gay, um, but there's a whole range of bullying that goes on that teachers need um, the abilities to address, um, and this really affects every single student in the classroom. Um, the other thing is that um, this isn't not necessarily, is not necessarily about acceptance. So that was kind of a backlash that we saw when the bullying, um, the suicides were happening was um, people were getting concerned though, why do we need to make them feel like they're accepted? And it's not just about that, it, it's kind of more about having kids feel safe talking about what's going on. And that's the, the way that I would describe it, that we're not um, trying to create some huge social change through this type of legislation, but we're giving kids the ability um, and, and teachers the ability to talk to each other about what's going on in school and about what their feelings are. And I think that this is the right framework for talking about suicide, um, in, in that kids need to feel comfortable and safe 
of talking about what they're feeling. And by having anti-bullying policies, like the GLSEN research shows, kids feel safer talking about that. Um, and just having them talk about what's on their mind is a way that they can feel safer at school, they can do better at school, and we can prevent the kind of tragedies that happen um, with, with suicides. Okay, when we talk about uh, enumerated categories, this is the number one thing that we hear back. Why can't we just use the golden rule, right? Why can't we just say be nice to each other? Um, and I think that this circles back around to the polling that I was talking about at the beginning about when teachers intervene. Um, we know that just saying be nice to each other doesn't work. It doesn't work for kids, nor does it work for the teachers or adults um, that are in a school, right? Because the adults said, um, well, sometimes I'll intervene if it's a homophobic slur. Sometimes I'll intervene, but I'll always intervene if it's a racial slur. Um, and the reason behind that is because they've been told um, that racial slurs are not accepted. And so I think that that's evidence to say that um, it's not enough just to say be nice, but we have to name specific actions that go on and help people understand why they're hurtful. Um, and so that's, you know, for both youth and adults, it's the same thing, that we have to name what's going on um, and not just be general. Um, you know, and, and then also more than just making a statement like the golden rule, uh, bullying policies also provide action steps. And I think that that's an important aspect of it as well. They give a pathway for reporting bullying and, and addressing it, whereas um, kind of general statements about, you know, be nice to each other, don't do that, right? And that's an important um, component of bullying legislation. Um, and like I said, it, it'll define bullying for adults and teachers as well and make it clear to them about what is a, uh, a situation that they need to address and um, what may not be. So finally, I just want to talk about building coalitions when you do this work. A few people have talked about this. I know Shannon said that, um, that they did a lot of work building statewide coalitions. Um, I think it's really important to include um, people of color when um, ad addressing these type of issues. One, because bullying um, obviously affects them as well. Um, but what we've seen is actually people would argue that addressing anti-gay bullying comes at the expense of addressing other types of bullying. Um, we know that that's not true, that it's not a zero-sum game. And in fact, addressing um, some types of bias will also help address other types of bias. Um, but that's something that, that you might encounter um, as, as pushback that we've seen from different groups. And and um, that's important to build in on the front end is doing, those, doing this work with a broad, um, broad types of community groups. Um, you know, I think it's also really important to get people of faith involved. Um, and here's where I actually find some really common ground that uh, uh, really religious kids, they get bullied a lot at school too. Um, and anti-bullying laws that are enumerated that protect kids based on um, religion um, are really helpful for those categories as well. And so to bring in groups um, of faith that, you know, might not necessarily be on the same page as, as LGBT activists pushing for um, an anti-bullying law, but it's really great common ground between the two. Um, and I think that that's uh, important to bring in. Um, you know, Shannon talked about one of the most important, you know, they had kids stand up and talk about being bullied about their body size, and that was really um, important in the implementation of the Illinois law. So um, I think that that's, um, you know, just another example of how we can bring in different types uh, of groups, different types of people that would support enumerated bullying policies. Um, and finally, like, please do reach out to other states that have done this work. I know Shannon said she reached out to other um, uh, other states that had done uh, past anti-bullying laws, and I know that even um, we've been successful in connecting people with um, work that's gone on in other states as well, um, and they're, they're really great allies, and so um, please, you know, please utilize that when doing your work. So if you do get pushed back for anti-bullying uh, legislation or you're concerned about that or you just want to talk it over, um, some of the groups that are on this call are, are really great at helping people um, people think through that. Um, and I would recommend a few others, like the Safe Schools Coalition, which is out of Washington, the Anti-Defamation League, Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, they've got really great networks and, and ideas for helping you um, deal with pushback. And also, um, feel free to, um, to give me a call. Just so you know, the network um, that, that I work with, um, we really do work on local issues. We tend not to get involved in state politics. Um, but so if there's implementation issues of the law, um, that come up in different specific districts, we'd be happy to help uh, uh, organize folks there. So there's my email address and uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and that's all I have for a presentation.
um, I guess now is going to be question time. Thank you so much, Ryan, uh, and thank you to all of our speakers. That was some incredibly helpful information that you all offered. Just as a reminder to everyone, um, we will be sending out um, an email with all of the resources that were mentioned and the links, um, as well as contact information for our speakers. Now uh, we're going to open it up to questions. Folks have been typing into the chat box throughout the webinar, and I have a few questions um, that I'll go ahead and read out loud um, and allow our presenters to respond to. So the first one is about uh, bullying on Facebook. Are there any provisions with anti-bullying laws that include threats or intimidation coming from third-person sources? <coughs> this is Shannon. I actually typed this to, to Jean um, in the chat box. But the Illinois law, and, and many others, although I don't have exact language in front of me, includes electronic communications as a means of perpetrating bullying behaviors, um, but there are First Amendment rights, and uh, the ACLU is one of the organizations that's tremendously serious about this. So the electronic communications has to also then meet the standards of substantively, quote unquote, bleeding over into school life, right? And our law has, and, and it's copied from many other laws that has those, you know, the severe pervasive list, it's called. Um, so it does include those electronic communications, but if it's solely happening off school grounds and is not bleeding over into school life, then it's, it's much harder for a school to intervene. I, w I would just say that Washington State added electronic bullying as a means in 2007, I believe. And uh, yeah, those same issues exist for schools. What's impacting the school day or what's uh, compromising the student's ability to, to uh, succeed in school. Definitely. A lot of states over the past several years have been adding so-called cyberbullying provisions into their current anti-bullying laws or, or adding them in when they pass a new, a new anti-bullying uh, bill. So it's really, it depends on the state. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, next question. Do you differentiate bullying from harassment, and how exactly? I can say Washington State lumps together harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and we, we offer no guidance around separating those three things. So, so there, and I guess one other thing I would add to that is Ryan was commenting on, um, you know, teachers not being clear on when they can intervene and not knowing when they'll, well, when they'll have administrative support. But one of the things we're saying in our law is do something. Um, you, even, even in the early stages, you don't have to wait until you're sure it's bullying to intervene. A lot of states group them together. Um, in our model, we do have separate definitions for bullying and harassment. This is the GLSEN model. And that's based on the, uh, the federal bill, the Safe Schools Improvement Act, which has separate definitions, where bullying is based on um, student, you know, physical harm to a student, and harassment is based on severe uh, or persistent or pervasive uh, behavior which might, may interrupt or the student's educational uh, achievements or the school environment. We have um, some anecdotal evidence that suggests people respond more empathetically when they hear the word harassment than when they hear the word bullying. Um, I'm not exactly, you know, it's nothing scientific, but um, I think for some people who are reluctant to address bullying, bullying is kind of seen as a rite of passage for them, and they kind of see that as, as innocent and, and really harmless, but the word harassment makes it a lot clearer that it, it is a lot um, more of a big deal. So, um, but, so anecdotally, we've seen people react a little bit better to the word harassment. All right, thank you. Next question. Uh, do you have to have both gender and gender identity listed, or can you just list gender and have that include gender identity? This is Allison. I think it's ideal to have both, uh, so that way both students and, and educators and everyone understands that, that both categories are covered. Uh, did you, is, was this sexual orientation and gender identity, or was it uh, gender and gender identity? The question was written as gender and gender identity. Okay. 
Well, I think if you have sex and gender identity, I think you don't necessarily need gender also. Um, but, but getting back to my other point, I think it's really important to try to list both sexual orientation and gender identity if possible, rather than grouping them, uh, as some states' laws do, as, um, you know, uh, sexual orientation includes the definition of, of gender identity. Uh, because then, you know, when a, when a school lists the, the, the full list in their policy, they, that might not be clear to the individual students and, and teachers who are reading the policy, so it might not be enforced in that way. And this is Shannon from Illinois. I'll add that um, we, attorneys tell us that you can make a legal argument that gender identity is implicitly protected when you list gender. Um, but that would only be to the point where it comes to an actual lawsuit or case. Um, so potentially, legally, it would include uh, gender identity as part and parcel of protecting based on gender, but I'm not sure that's clear to people. So that was one of the, because we have had, we've gotten that question actually quite a bit. Okay, our next question, are the enumerated policies really the cause of feeling safer or are schools that are already safe more likely to have such policies? This is a tricky one. I think the answer to that is yes. Um, it, it was important for us, for students to be able to see themselves in the policy. Maybe nowhere else do they see themselves um, in school policy or in district policy. So it was important for the enumeration. And yes, I'm sure it's easier to get that done in districts that are receptive. But of course, in Washington State, all districts had to adopt our policy and procedure. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, next question, are there other entities besides GLSEN that are gathering data on enumeration? Um, and this is from someone that says they live in a conservative state. Well, GLSEN does have, um, you know, we've been collecting data on, on enumeration um, and policies for about 10 years. Um, there are definitely other policy papers about the importance of enumeration based on various research. I, I couldn't quote who else has done the research offhand, um, but there, those resources are available. I, I have some, I'd be able to pass them on uh, if you were to contact me. All right, thank you, Allison. Uh, can anyone share some good model cyberbullying language for laws and or policies? I think the best cyberbullying language I've seen is in the uh, Anti-Defamation League ADL model. They have, they have great cyberbullying language in there. Um, we also have some in our model, and our model district policy has, has cyberbullying language as well. This is Shannon again. I, I should say too, I mean in terms of the actual state law, the, the language that we have and others have around electronic communications, it's probably the, you know, not the best, that's not the right way to say it, but with First Amendment rights being considered, um, there's a limitation to what you can do in law, and, and that's for good reason, I should say, you know, um, the First Amendment is tremendously important. Um, and we've been working a lot on the task force that I mentioned with trying to help schools around, there's a lot of concern around cyberbullying, um, a lot of concern around the intensity of its impact for young people. Um, and what a lot of the literature says is that the best way to address cyberbullying is actually to do a really good job at helping young people understand their use of technology. Um, so that it's not actually, so far, and this is obviously a new field, necessarily an anti-bullying policy is where the greatest impact is, but it, the, where they're seeing impact around lessening cyberbullying is in ensuring that young people feel empowered in how to use technology, what the consequences of using technology are, um, uh, and things that are sometimes even referred to as like computer or internet safety stuff. So I'll just put that out there. Okay, thank you so much. For anyone else that has a question they'd like to ask the presenters, you can unmute your individual line by pressing star 7, and we'll go ahead and open it up to 
to questions for the next few minutes. So it's star seven to unmute your line and ask a question. All right. Um, if anyone has a question that they didn't have a chance to ask, like I said, I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email with contact information um, for our presenters. We will also have a link to this webinar um, featured on our website. Um, and I also want to invite you and encourage you to complete a really brief evaluation survey. You'll be directed um, there will be a window that will pop up when you log out of this webinar. Um, and we'll also be sending a link with that evaluation um, in the email with all of the additional resources. So I want to thank everyone for attending the webinar and also thanks to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, I appreciate you all taking time out of your busy schedules to help us out. Um, and if anyone has any remaining questions, they can contact me. Kay Lafferty at thesociety.org. Um, and thank you all. Have a lovely afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.